Praise God. Who's glad to be here today? Amen. Hallelujah. I am too. I really, really am. I'm very excited and, and expectant for what the Lord has for us this morning. Amen. Um, Pastor Pam called me a few weeks ago and she goes, Pastor James, I'm going to be out of town. Now she was going to be out of town today, but because she was going on vacation, not because she was having to go to a funeral and all that changed. And so she said, I might need you to preach. I don't know yet. And so I was rumbling things around in my mind and what have you. And then uh, she called me, I believe it was Tuesday. And the Lord had already been speaking to me on Monday about, you know, these things that were going in my mind. I don't know about y'all, but when I got something coming up, I'm kind of planning on what I'm going to do. But then on Monday, the Lord really started bringing a lot of confirmation on it. And then we were talking Tuesday. She goes, oh, I had this come up. I, I'm going to need you to speak in two weeks. And I go, Pastor Pam, that's next Sunday. You realize that, right? She goes, oh, my gosh. So as, as the Lord was speaking to me a few weeks ago, I spoke a message about reset. The Lord is calling us to reset. Put our odometer back to zero. We come with experience. It's not like getting a brand new car. Whenever you rebuild that, when I rebuilt that, or well, when they rebuilt it, but I got that tractor with that being completely rebuilt. Uh, I think Susie had been out of my house a few days after that, and she goes, is that that tractor you were talking about? It's got a few dits and dings, and it needs some makeup. I get it. But, boy, that thing runs good. And so it's been reset to zero. It comes with all that experience that it gathered, right? But it has been rebuilt. It's being reset. And so as I was asking the Lord and focusing on the Lord for today's message, I really felt like the word he, he gave me was rest. Rest. And, and, and as I began to meditate on that and think about it, the Lord began to bring up questions in my heart and thoughts in my mind. And so today's message is, is titled, Just God. Just God. And that's what we're going to talk about. Just God. Is he enough? Is he enough? Now, I know we all, we're good Christians here. Hallelujah. We're not like the church down the street. You know, we, we say, oh, yeah, he's just enough. By golly. But you know what? We say it, but how often do we live it? And you'll hear me say that a lot. We say it, or we, we say we believe it, or we think it. But when it comes to the proof and the pudding, where the, where, where, where the rubber meets the road, a lot of times we don't implement it. Amen. So is God enough? Father God, this morning, I just pray you speak through me, Father God, this message you've given to me, Lord. I pray, Father God, that everyone's heart here is touched and changed, Father God, that we be transformed into the likeness of Jesus, Father. And Father God, that we learn to, tr to rest in you, Lord, and we learn to live with you being just enough. Lord, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, before we get started, I do have a little bit of house cleaning or housekeeping I need to do here. And it's going to, I'm going to read a scripture. Now, it's not, it, it, normally when we read scriptures, you know, it's like, you know, John 3, 16 or something. Well, this is 2 Kings 4, verse 8 through 37. So it's nearly a whole chapter, okay? So it, it's going to take a little bit to get through it. But I want us to read it because it kind of sets up where we're going today. So if you have your, script, your, your Bible, 2 Kings 4, 8 through 9, I know we have New Living up there, and I think I'm reading from the New King James Version. Um, but it says, verse 8, Now it happened one day that Elisha went to Shunem, where there was a notable woman, and she persuaded him to eat some food. So it was, as often as he passed by, he would turn in there to eat some food. And she said to her husband, Look now. I know this is a holy man of God who passes by us regularly. I don't know what have eaten food has to do with being a holy man of God, but I'm up for the challenge. Amen? All right. Verse 10. Please let us make a small upper room on the wall and let us put a bed there for, uh, for him there and a table and a chair and a lampstand. So it will be whenever he comes to us, he can turn in there. Verse 11. And it happened one day that he came there and he turned into the upper room and lay down there. Then he, said to the, then he said to Gehazi, his servant, call this Shunammite woman. When he had called her, she stood before him, and he said to, to him, say now to her, look, you have been concerned for us with all this care. What can I do for you? Do you want me to speak on your behalf to the king or to the commander of the army? She answered, I dwell among my own people. Verse 14, so he said, what 
then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, Actually, she has no son, and her husband is old. So he said to her, Call her. When he had called her, she stood in the doorway. Then she said, Then he said, About this time next year you shall embrace a son. And she said, No, my Lord, man of God, do not lie to your maidservant. Ooh, story's kind of getting interesting. I don't know if you're following it here. Let's keep going. Verse 17. But the woman conceived, hallelujah, she acted in faith. All the married couples said, hallelujah. So she, she acted in faith. The, uh, the woman conceived and bore a son. And when the appointed time had come of Elisha, which, would, which ha, of Elisha had told her. Verse 18. And the child grew. Now it happened one day that he went out to his father, to the reapers. And he said to his father, my head, my head. So he said to a servant, carry him to his mother. When he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he set her on her knees till noon, and then he died. Verse 21, and she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God, shut the door upon him, and went out. Then she called to her husband and said, please send me one of the young men and one of the donkeys that I may run to the man of God and come back. This is noon. This, this all happened about noon, okay? So he said, why are you going to him today? It is neither the new moon nor the Sabbath. And she said... It is well. She said, it is well. Verse 24, then she saddled a donkey and said to her servant, drive and go forward. Do not slacken the pace for me unless I tell you. We're talking, this is a distance of about 20 miles. She told her husband, it's noon. Her son dies. She takes him up, puts him on the bed. I'm not imagining it's going to take a long time to do that. So let's say 15, 20 minutes. She sends a servant out to her husband and says, hey, send me a donkey. Send me a, 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 a servant to help lead this donkey. You know, husbands, they want, why? What's going on, you know? Amen, hallelujah. Women, y'all y'all know how we are. Y'all know how we are. And and, and so I'm, let's say another 45 minutes here, you know. We're looking an hour. And now she's got to go 20 miles one way because she said, and I'm going to run over there. And I'm going to run right back. 40 miles on a donkey. How many of you ever ridden a horse? Oh, I've, I, I love riding horses. We had horses when I was a kid. We'd, we'd ride them things, and it was a blast. It was fun to run them. But you can't run a horse very long, especially whenever they're not used to running. We didn't have the Pony Express at my house. We had, you know, just the pony, right? And so riding a horse... It's going to take a while to get 20 miles. And then you got to come 20 miles back. And we're already starting the story about, let's say about noon. And then, so by the time she leaves, 1 o'clock, let's see, let's, five miles an hour. I don't know how quick a, a horse walks. They say a human walks five miles an hour. A servant was leading this thing. So I'll say, we're looking at eight-hour round trip for 40 miles. It's, there's, there's a lot of effort going into this, okay? Verse 25, and so she departed and went to the man of God at Mount Carmel. So it was when the man of God saw her, saw her afar off that he said to his servant Gehazi, Look, the Shunammite woman, please run now to meet her and say to her, Is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with the child? And she answered, It is well. Same thing she answered her husband, isn't it? Verse 27, now when she came to the man of God at the hill, she got him by the feet, but Gehazi came near to push her away. But the man of God said, and I love this, he said, let her alone, leave her alone, for her soul is in deep distress. Her soul is in anguish, and the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me. Oh, God won't hide anything. Y'all read what I read, right? God doesn't always reveal things to us. Not even the man of God. Amen. All right, let's keep reading. Verse 28, so she said, did I ask a son of my Lord? Did I not say, do not deceive me? Then he said to Gehazi, get yourself ready and take my staff in your hand and be on your way. If you meet anyone, do not greet him. And if anyone greets you, do not answer him. But lay my staff on the face of the child. And the mother of the child said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So he arose and followed her. Verse 31, now Gehazi went on ahead of them and laid the staff on the face of the child, but there was neither voice nor hearing 
Then, therefore, he went back to meet him and told him, saying, The child has not awakened. I love this. This, the, the, the Gehazi, this guy, he's been with Elisha for, for several years, we're assuming here. He's been around. He knows how ministry is supposed to happen. He's been out with Elisha, and Elisha said, Hey, do this, put my staff on something, and it happens. Somebody gets healed, whatever. And here, I love what he's doing. Because, and also, Elisha told him, Go do this. But then Elisha changed the plans, right? And, and this guy, he's trying to do something old that would have worked before. It's worked in the past. It would have worked had Elisha not changed the orders, right? But now it doesn't. And he's surprised. He's surprised. It didn't work. It didn't work. Verse 32, when Elisha came into the house, there was the child laying dead on his bed. He went in, therefore, shut the door behind the two of them, and prayed to the Lord. And he went up and lay on the child and put his mouth on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes, and his hands on his hands. And he stretched himself out on the child. And the flesh of the child became warm. Verse 35, he returned and walked back and forth in the house and again went up and stretched himself out on him. Then the child sneezed seven times, and the child opened his eyes. And he called Gehazi and said, Call the Shunammite woman. So he called her, and when she came into him, he said, pick up your son. So she went in, fell at his feet, and bowed to the ground. Then she picked up her son and went out. Point number one, we're going to talk about the Shunammite woman. She was a wealthy woman in Israel. We start off the story in verse 8. She's prominent. She's notable. This lady, she probably had money. She probably had quite a bit of influence. And so anytime Elisha would come through town, she noticed. And she's like, hey, let's give him some meal. Let's give him a place to, 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 to rest. And he, he visited often enough that she petitioned her husband. She said, hey, honey, honeys, we know how those petitions are, right? Would you please build an extra room? My wife's asking me to build an extra bathroom, you know. I'm like, oh, one day. She asked her husband if they could build a room on the roof of the house for the prophet. Who said feeding the pastor or the prophet doesn't come with benefits? Amen. Won't open blessings over your life. So when Elisha passed through that area, he had a place to rest and to eat. He had a place to stay. Elisha was so appreciative that one day he called for her and asked, what can I do for you? What do you need? What, what is it that you need in your, in your life? And what was her answer? I don't need anything. I, got my, I'm, I live with my people. In other words, I got my posse. I got my group of people. I don't have any needs. I have a house. I got a husband that loves me. We got servants. I got friends. I got people who are. Who, 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 are our support group. These are my people. There's nothing I need. How many of us have ever been there where we don't need anything? Praise God. I've been there a few times. It's nice. But you know what? We can always use something else. We can always use need more. Amen. But Elisha's servant later said to him, Sir, her husband is very old and she has no son. God bless the old guys. In those days, that meant everything they had worked so hard for their whole life was about to amount to nothing. Even today. Even today. You know, the uh, Friday, my, my sister and I went to Brady, Texas. Anybody ever been down to Brady, Texas? I didn't even know Brady, Texas existed. D d yeah, there's a bunch of deer and everything down there. But we went down to Brady, Texas to pick up uh, some sheep for our kids for 4-H. And we're down there and we're talking to these people. I mean, this lady is the nicest lady you've ever met in your life. I mean, she is gold. And we're out there, you know, and, and while we're out there, one of, their, one of their sheep had lambed and they couldn't find it. So, oh, well, let's help you find it. And my sister says, well, just how big is this place? She goes, oh, it's 2,000 acres. 
Hallelujah. I got two acres and I'm like struggling. They got 2,000 and I got, we got 16 kids on our place over there, you know, between my sisters and myself, 16 kids and we're struggling with our seven acres and these folks are doing it with two acres. And as we talk to them and we're getting to know them, we, you get that feeling that, you know what, the, these folks, I don't think they got kids. We go inside and we're talking to them, and they've been foster parents, and they're, oh, look, this is our foster son and, 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 and our foster daughter, and look what they've done. But they don't have kids. And this is a sheep ranch that is the oldest sheep ranch in Texas, 150 or no, 170 something years old, before the Civil War. Her great great whatever grandpa started this. And now, they don't have anybody to turn it over to. Not because they don't love kids, just life happened. They've been foster parents, of course they love children. But in this time, that was, there was a disgrace with that. I don't have anybody to pass this on to. I don't have anybody to give this to. So Elisha calls her back in and says, he, he didn't ask, he, did, he didn't investigate, he didn't say, oh, well, uh, w would you like a son? He didn't ask her that. She comes back in. She walks through the door and he says, a year from now, you're going to have a son. And what was her response? <coughs> no, 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 no. And it wasn't a no, 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 like I don't want kids. It was a, she said, no, my Lord. She's been desiring this for so long. It had been a passion and a desire of hers for so long. No, my Lord, do not lie to me. What, was she, what she was saying is, don't go there. Don't touch that. Don't play with my emotions. It's taken me years to put that down, to suppress it. Because if we see this, she wasn't even healed from it. She suppressed it. And there's a big difference. She says, it's taken years for me to put that dream to sleep. Do not wake it up. She knew he was a man of God. She knew God would hear him. She knew he was a prophet. And if he spoke, it was going to happen. God was going to honor it. And she said, no. You know, we got a good family friend. We, I, I love this guy to death. He's young, younger than me. So he's, he's still, we're, we're still young. Hallelujah. And he suffered so much trauma as a kid. And he was sick so often. They told me he'd never be able to have kids. So he grew up, you know, whatever, got married, told his wife, hey, we're never going to be able to have kids. Oh, okay, well, that's fine. Lo and behold, she gets pregnant. Boy, he was excited. I mean, you can imagine, right? And she loses the baby. He was so devastated. He went out and got a vasectomy. And he says, I never, ever want to go through that again. And I'm sure that's where this lady's at. She goes, I don't ever want to, I don't want those emotions to come up. I don't want that to be awoken. But what happens the next year we see the prophecy, prophecy is fulfilled and she's got a baby in her arms. Amen. So we can imagine how much she loved this baby. This, this boy was probably pretty spoiled, right? And rightfully so. I mean, I got four and I got them pretty spoiled. You know, if I had one in my old age, that thing would be rotten. But that's okay. You can imagine that she loves this baby. It's not only her son, it's her dream. Y'all following me? How many of us have dreams in here? How many of us have dreams who we've had to put to sleep? How many of us had to have dreams that died? So it's not only her son, it's her dream. It's her future. It's her family's future. Her family now gets to carry on a legacy. They have, they, they have somebody to go to the next generation. It doesn't end with her and her husband. She has a promise from God. This boy is her everything. So the boy grows up, right? He's probably not full grown yet, but he's growing up. He's, he's, he's grown up enough he can go to work with daddy. But I'm assuming, 
from just what we can draw from the story here. He's probably pretty spoiled. He goes out to work with daddy, and all of a sudden, he goes, oh, dad, I don't feel good. Oh, dad, I got a headache. What does dad say? Go to your mama. Typical response, right? My kids come to me, finger hanging off. Go to your mama, see what she can do, put a Band-Aid on it, you know. Let me kiss it. No, 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 mama kiss it. Works great. I don't know what it is about mama kisses. Typical response, go talk to your mom. But anyways, so the boy goes home, crawls up in his mama's lap to take a nap, and he dies. And there she's holding the dream that God gave her dead in her arms. I know I've told this story once before about when we were in the Dominican Republic and Hadassah started having convulsions. And, and, and after the convulsion, she just went limp like she was dead. Her little eyeballs rolled up. She might have been breathing four times a minute. And I'm holding her in my arms. And I remember crying out, God, no. It hurt. Man, I don't know if you've been there. I don't know if, you're, if you've had your kid like that, but ooh, that's tough. If anyone tells you the Bible's boring, they aren't reading it. This boy died. God's promise to her, because God said, I'm going to give you that boy. And God's promise died. The dream she had put to sleep and God had revived. The word of God formed her son and now he's dead. What? I don't know about you, but I'd be broken. I was broken. I was in the middle of that, that, that grocery store. I was at the front counter and I was crying. And I had my baby in my arms. And boy, somebody would holler out, and I'd think it was a doctor, and I'd swing around like that, and them little arms flailing. I was broken. I imagine this lady was broken. I would be crying, yelling, snot coming out. And what does a woman do? She takes a boy upstairs, puts him on his bed, on Elisha's bed. She grabs a donkey. And she leaves. And when, when her husband asked her, why? She goes, eh, all's good. I just need to go talk to him about something. Today we'd say, that woman's in denial. No, she had a promise from God. And she wasn't going to let that promise die because of the circumstances around her. You following me? There's a difference. There's sometimes we got to let things go. But there's other times we have a promise from God. And this, is a, this ain't even in my notes, but I'm going to go here. A lot of times us Christians claim to have a promise from God when it's just a hope of ours. We need to learn to distinguish between the two. I'm the spoiler alert because let me tell you something. If it's a promise from God, it can be revived. Amen. All right, let's keep going in the story. So, so she, she takes him up to the room. She lays him on the bed, gets a donkey, leaves. And when Elisha sees her in the distance, he calls out. I, what were these guys doing in the Old Testament? Uh, when you read the Bible, it's like they were sitting on the wall and saw so-and-so running from a distance and said, oh, my goodness, look, that's so-and-so. I mean, I can't tell my kids apart when they're down playing under the trees and I'm at my house. That's 200 yards. You know, I saw them from a distance. So anyways, he calls out, is everything okay? Is your husband okay? Is your son okay? And still at a distance, she sends back the word, it's all good. Everything's okay. It is well. So she gets there, she falls down at Elisha's feet, and she begins to tell him everything that's happened. By this point, I, I, think, I think she's like, she can't hold it together. She's just pouring out her heart now. Being the man of God, Elisha jumps into action. He says to the servant, take my staff and my servant and go lay it on the staff on the boy. But the woman refuses. 
She says, as surely as the Lord lives, as surely as your soul lives, I'm not leaving without you. The prophet represented God. That was God on earth. Just as you and I represent God. And I said it before, we represent God on earth. How are others going to know about Jesus if you and I aren't living it? There wasn't any amen there, and there should have been. So Elijah goes with her. When he gets to the house, he goes upstairs by himself. He, well, he's got a servant with him. He lays down on the, uh, the boy, hands to hands, mouth to mouth, prays a few times, and then something miraculous happens. The boy comes back to life. He calls the boy's mother and she takes him downstairs. I don't know all the ins and outs. I don't know the whys. I don't know why God did this, why it happened like that, why the boy died, why he had to lay on him mouth to mouth, hand to hand. I don't know nothing about that. The Bible's not specific on that. But what I do know, the boy was dead. The mama went to God. God showed up, and the boy's back alive. Amen. Amen. I know what you're thinking. What's the point of the story? What's this all about, Pastor James? What does this have to do with rest? What was the point of her going through all that pain of, of, of carrying a baby? Even though she wanted that baby, she desired that baby her whole life. Ladies, month nine comes around, you're ready for that thing to come out. My wife had four. And she's like, get this out of me. It says, that's what she told the doctor, get this out of me. She was ready. And see our poor animals walking around pregnant and they're just like, James, James. They, they learned to talk English, I don't know. Our sheep, they go, James, <laughs> get it out. It doesn't matter how big that dream is, there's a time when it needs out. It needs to be born. And then she, she, she went through the suffering and the pain of raising this boy. Hello. I love my kids, but whoo, they are every bit of their mother's kids. Every bit. <laughs> Gentlemen, y'all missed a great opportunity to say amen. It would have been better for her if she never had the kid. It would have been better if I'd never had the kid. This was my desire. This was my dream. But I learned how to live without it. And then you give it to me, God. And I guarantee you, I don't know if she did, but I know, some, I, know I probably would have said, and God, you took it away from me. That's what Job said. What was the point of all that suffering, all that work? Well, here's one point. And let me tell you something about our God. Our God is amazing. Not just our God, God, he is God, amen. There is no other God. God is amazing. He loves me as an individual. He, I mean, I, I am, I hung the moon in his eyes. Hate to break the bad news to y'all. But you know what? The amazing thing is we all hung the moon in his eyes. He loves us individually and he loves us as a group. Some people will go through a process that's so painful, so hard, and others just skip through life. We can learn from both of them. We often think the one who's skipping through life, oh man, they got everything together. I don't know why. They're skipping through life. But I will tell you something. All the pain I've been through, all the struggle that I've had to endure in my life, others benefit from it. If nobody else but my kids. If nobody else than the people I get to share with, my life with. Somebody who might hear me on a Sunday morning. So, it's not for nothing. Amen? One of the reasons I think... God allowed all this to happen. God gives you a dream. That dream comes to life. 
God shows up in your dream and all of a sudden your dream dies. I think one of the reasons is God wants to see what is more important to you, the dream or him. What's more important? And you know what? There's some lessons. If we're astute, we can learn from other people. As a missionary for, for, for 10 years of my life, one quarter of my life, that's a lot. One quarter sounds bigger than 10 years. For a decade of my life, I was a missionary, living on the field missionary. It was a dream. And when God called us back to the United States, it was hard to readjust. Not just because of the culture, but because all of a sudden, this thing that is your dream is no longer. And then you have people who help support you, and then they're like, oh, well, you're back in the States. You're not a missionary any longer. They stop supporting you. They're like, that's like putting salt on the wound, you know. They didn't know. God bless them. They didn't know. Right? So now we've learned, and that's the point of today's message, rest. We're learning to rest. Is God enough without being a missionary? Is God enough without having a son? Is God enough without me living my dream? Hello? The Shunammite woman's response is clear. What did she do when her dream died? She headed straight for the man of God. He asks her all kinds of questions, and she says everything's fine. But when she gets close enough, she tells him everything that's going on. She tells him everything that's going on. Maybe she doesn't understand what's happening, but she is going to hang on to God no matter what. She said, don't send your servant. I'm not leaving until you leave. God, I'm hanging on to you. She may not understand all the if, ands, whys, and whats, and buts, and all that stuff. But she understands, I need God, and I'm hanging on to God. Point number two. We talked about the shooting night woman. Now we're going to talk about Abraham. We've got another story. We all know the story of Abraham. Father Abraham had many sons. Or is that, is that am I too old school? Many sons had father Abraham. Go to children's church, people. All right. Um, we know the story of Father Abraham. He was old, 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 old. And God gives him a son, Isaac. 25 years prior to Isaac being born, God had given him the promise of Isaac. So as you can imagine, Abraham loves Isaac a lot. That's like my baby. That's mine. And then one day calls Abraham over and says, hey, Abraham, how's it going? Yeah, okay. Man, your sheep and your cows and your cattle and your donkeys and your goats. Everything's going good. Yeah, man, Lord, you've blessed me here. Everything's great. Oh, that boy you gave me. He's, he's, he's every bit of his father, son. I love that guy. He's a good kid. And then God says, what do you love more? Your dream, the promised Isaac, or me? And what does Abraham say? <laughs> Come on, Lord, that's easy. I love you. I love you. That's easy. God says, okay, put him on the altar, kill him and sacrifice him. And I guarantee, double dog T you, that Abraham didn't go, all right, let's go. Isaac was his dream. Isaac was his promise from God. Isaac was his continued inheritance. He, he was the name bearer. He was the one who God, God said, I'm going to bless the nations of the world. I'm going to bless the world through you. And that came through Isaac. I'm sure Abraham said, well, well you, 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 I rebuke you in the name of Jesus devil trying to talk to me no I'm sure he's like let me clean my ears out Lord somebody bring me q-tip I'm not hearing well 
I imagine there's a long pause. I imagine Abraham's heart falls to the floor. And I'm sure he said, God, that, that, that's my boy. That's the promised one. That's the one you told me. I'm sure he asked God, God, how's this going to work out? And I, I don't know the complete process because the Bible doesn't tell us. But from the point where he talked to God and they went to the, to the mountain to do the sacrifice, Abraham had, had worked it out in his mind how God's going to do it. Because when they get to the mountain, Isaac says, hey, daddy, we're here to do the sacrifice like we've done a hundred times before. Where's the ram? And what did Abraham tell him? God's going to provide. God's going to provide. And he said, in, 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 in another place there in the scripture, and I don't have it written down, but, but, but it says, God, he said, God can bring him back to life. I don't remember exactly how it's phrased, but that's what it says. He, Abraham trusted, even if he killed him, God can bring him back to life. He worked this out. He knew what, was God, what God was going to do. All right, God, you're going to kill him. I don't really know why, but okay, you're going to do it. It's going to be for your glory. Let's go strap that boy down, kill him, and then you'll raise him back up. So that's what Abraham did. He put Isaac on the altar to kill him, but God stopped him before he killed Isaac. You know what God learned about Abraham that day? You know what Abraham learned about Abraham that day? <laughs> that Abraham would let go of everything before he would let go of God. Are we willing to let go of everything before we let go of God? That's called rest. Are you willing to let go of that dream house, that dream child, that dream spouse? Are you willing to let go of whatever great desire you have and say, God, I don't know how in the world this is going to work out, but I'm just going to hang on to you. And if it never comes, that's okay because you're enough. C.S. Lewis said it this way, and I love it. He who has God plus many things has nothing more than he who has God alone. He who has God plus many things has nothing more than he who has God alone. God is, that's it. Let me say it this way. God is infinite. Nothing is added to God. Nothing can meet our needs more than God alone. God is everything we need. Let me put a parenthesis around this, okay? Because in church, we tend to say, wow, Jesus, a God's all I need. And it is, but you know what? I need God in you. I need God in you. I need God in you, Brother Larry. And I need him. God is not just up there. God is here. You are a representation of God that I need. So I need you. I'm not saying we're the Lone Ranger out here because we're not. God didn't create us that way. He created us as a family. Christian life isn't about running around like a maniac. It's about walking with God. First John says, how can you love God when you don't love your brother? It's impossible. I need to walk with you. Our Christian life is not about the impact we make. It's about obedience. It's not about making stuff up. It's about listening. What is walking with God? Simple. Do what he asks you to do each and every day. He asks you to put that dream on the altar, put it on the altar. What if he doesn't revive it? Beloved, he's got something way better. 
Oh, but it's going to hurt me. Yep. But he's going to be there with you. He's going to be there with you. I'm not saying it's not painful. I'm not saying it's not going to hurt. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. It's going to be hard. But God's with you. We're with you too. Be in a relationship with him, with your brother. Fill your mind with his word and let his word penetrate every walking moment, waking moment. That's one thing that the shooting mount woman did. That's one thing that Abraham did. They remembered the promise, the specific promise from God. There's a lot of promises in the Bible that we apply to our life that I would call are kind of general promises, you know. Yes, God wants the best for me. And we go, well, God wants the best for me. For you, who knows? I don't know. But that, that, that scripture's for me. No, God has a specific blessing for you, a promise for your life. I don't know. I, don't, I haven't heard it. I don't know what it is. Don't worry. You keep grabbing on to him, you're going to get it. Build your room on the side of your house. Invite the man or the woman of God out to dinner. I ain't got no money. I'm not the rich shooting tonight, moment. Don't matter. I tell you what, you, I've been to some houses. People invite me over, and we sit down, and they spend their last $2 to go buy some crackers and a bottle of Coca-Cola. I'm not there for the food, beloved. I'm there to be with them. Elisha visited a lot of places. He didn't go for the food. He went for the people. He went because God said go. If you want to experience God in your life, get around godly people. That's for another sermon. I'm not going to charge you all for that one today.